hello and thank you for attending the NASIG 2020 session on International Publishing Pr Partnerships, presented by Anthony Kond, the Managing Director at Liverpool University Press, John Morgenstern, the Director at Clemson University Press, and Teresa Whitaker from the Medieval Institute Publications at Western Michigan University. You can find information on these speakers on the conference schedule. Please also participate in our online forum, which can be located at the NASIG website with questions or comments about this session. These links are provided below the video. NASIG's code of conduct applies to all discussion on the forum, and we would ask that you please tweet about this session using the hashtag NASIG2020. We would like to thank the sponsors at NASIG for making our online conference freely available. And now I am going to pass it over to our speakers so they can begin the presentation. Thank you. On behalf of um, the panel, I'd like to thank everyone at NASIG for um, organizing this presentation. Um, for allowing us this opportunity to share some ideas about our partnerships and also for pivoting to an online conference to allow us to continue to share ideas during this um, difficult period of self-isolation, um, which is sort of anathema to partnerships. <laughs> um, um, in, um, in 1989, the University of Rochester and the British scholarly publisher Boyd Allen Brewer entered into a pioneering international partnership whereby editorial staff at Rochester would acquire books for which Boyd Allen Brewer would provide production, marketing, and worldwide distribution. Boyd Allen Brewer gained a foothold in the American market, which is still the largest in scholarly publishing. Rochester quickly earned a reputation for excellence in publishing in a variety of fields, including musicology, African studies, and European history, and American history. The Rochester model, as it's sometimes called, has more recently inspired other scholarly publishers in Europe to invest in similarly, to similarly invest in the growth of smaller American university presses, namely the partnership between the Medieval Institute publications at Western Michigan University and the Gruder, an independent academic publisher headquartered in Berlin, and the Clemson University Press partnership with Liverpool University Press. The whole enterprise of academic publishing relies on partnerships at all stages, from peer review to distribution. The business models and reporting structures of university presses accordingly reflect, to an increasing degree, their reliance on partnerships. Presses commonly partner with learned societies and organizations on book series and journals. Typically, the society underwrites publishing costs, while presses bring publishing expertise to partnership. Facilitated by digital distribution, an increasing number of journal partnerships have been forged between American universities and foreign uh, American university presses and foreign universities, extending their reach. For example, um, some Asian universities have partnered with um, presses in the English speaking world. The upward trend for university presses to migrate under the organizational umbrella of libraries has prompted innovative partnerships with scholarly communications and library publishing units, particularly on digital publications and open access programs. According to data compiled by the Association of University Presses in 2019, 29 member presses report within libraries, and it's now the second most common reporting structure among member presses. Several statewide university systems across the United States maintain a publishing consortium. The University of California Press, the University of uh, University Press of Mississippi, SUNY Press, the University Press of Florida, the University Press of Kentucky, to name just a handful. Presses within the United States have entered into partnerships to increase efficiencies. For instance, as of 2018, Bucknell University Press books have been fully integrated within the publishing program of Rutgers University Press. A growing body of scholarly literature reg registers the impact of partnerships of these kinds, including model case studies. Why are the international publishing po uh, partners that follow the Rochester model unique? What can we learn from them about evol the evolving nature of academic publishing? This session features case studies of these vanguard partnerships and explores the benefits of international collaboration, the challenges that arise from it, and ultimately how transatlantic partnerships are impacting scholarly publishing. Each of us will offer some background and context for our partnerships, explain how they work in practice, and discuss benefits we gain and the challenges we face. 
We'll then take some time to constellate outward to consider how these partnerships articulate with broader concerns in, in scholarly publishing as a whole um, in hopes of inspiring further research and discussion. Um, first case study will be um, Teresa. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Teresa Whitaker, and I'm the editor in chief at Medieval Institute Publications, which is on the campus of Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Many people know Kalamazoo because of the International Congress on Medieval Studies, so it makes sense that a medieval press has a home there. We started officially in 1978. We are a university press, and we're part of the Association of University Presses. In the beginning, we just had one series. And we have grown now to have 14 academic series, six classroom oriented series and three journals. And we publish material from, um, ranging from the late antique to the medieval and early modern periods. I've been with the press since the summer of 2007, uh, began as a copy editor, then moved up to managing editor and then stepped into the editor in chief role shortly before our partnership with Decorator began, which was in July of 2018. So in multiple ways, I had to hit the ground running. So I was new to the role, we were new to the partnership, and there was a lot of stuff that we were figuring out. So flexibility and having a newness to the role was actually surprisingly helpful. So the partnership started because we were looking quite honestly at the field of publishing and being a small press is, is hard. We knew we wanted to grow. We knew that there had been some administrative changes at our university and there was also some change in obviously leadership at the press. And we knew that the best way to acknowledge that growth and have, be able to do it the way we wanted to was looking at for an outside partner. So DeGreuter ended up being sort of a natural fit. And what you'll hear about many partnerships is that some of these international partners really wanted that foothold in the US. And then we had the advantage of having a very niche market in medieval um, interdisciplinary scholarship. So they wanted to have a little bit more of that in their program. We wanted to have a little bit more of the worldwide reach. So it ended up being quite a, quite a natural partnership. Um, it allowed both of us to grow and have a mutual international presence. So they got the US side, we got the international European rest of world. Um, and then both of us, it allowed us to maintain our production standards and also the personal touch with authors. That's something we're both interested in and we wanted to maintain. So it's been two years now. Um, at the end of July, it'll be two years, which seems hard to believe sometimes or all our conception of time right now is a little skewed, I think. But it's definitely been mutually beneficial and allowed us to grow on both sides. So we now have access to in, in both ways, scale, um, the age of both of our presses. So DeGreuter far has the edge of that. They're 260 years old, whereas we are 40, 45 years old. And it allows us to have the marketing reach that we both have sort of corners in. So to get into the nuts and the bolts of the split, we both have a split of monetary responsibility and production responsibility. So I'll touch on the basics of that. Financially, it's largely split, split by who is responsible for which step. So MIP acquires, we're responsible for the academic content, although we both discuss projects. So we, we oversee that. Um, and then when it transfers to production steps at DeGreuter, so copy editing, typesetting, printing, distribution, they oversee the financial aspects of that. WMU personnel are paid for by WMU and are part of the College of Arts and Sciences there. And that includes four people. Um, I'm the only one that is directly <laughs> or an only responsible to the press. Our director has other responsibilities on campus. Our financial and editorial assistant is, also has other responsibilities. She teaches part-time and our administrative assistant is shared between two departments. Degrader personnel are paid for by Degrader, so that's largely the EDP, the editorial design and production. And then both sides have freelancers that we depend upon. Our acquisitions editors are freelancers, as are our copy editors, and then we work with a typesetting firm um, to do much of that. And then interestingly enough, we had both used the same printer, CPI, which has locations both in the UK and Germany and also has US partners. So production, I sort of touched on. Um, the amount of projects a year contractually, we're aiming for 20. So we want to contract 20 titles a year. And that's with the partnership with DeGreuter. MIP is also responsible for, solely responsible for the journals and the classroom texts. So Teams text, which many of you might be familiar with, that is housed in MIP. 
So we decide on projects at month monthly publishers meetings. So we discuss proposals, mostly brought in by MIP acquisitions editors, but DeGrader also has the option to bring in projects to the table. And we both look at our budget sheets, the profit and loss, p and you'll hear many times, and decide what we want to move forward with. MIP does have the option to go forward with projects that DeGrader might feel are a little bit either financially risky or maybe not quite fitting their publishing program, so we do have that option, but we are mostly moving forward with projects together. One of the obvious things that may not be so obvious is we have to be aware of different time zones. So us in the US and DeGrader in Berlin, we have to be aware of meeting times um, and we take advantage quite naturally of online everything. So Zoom or Skype for publishers meetings, we have an online database, our Google Drive is where we house a lot of our production folders, we have online metadata systems, spreadsheets that track everything, and email, 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 much email. So in some ways we were very prepared to be working from home and honestly this hasn't affected greatly our way of work. So getting back to a little bit of the production, so we, MIP, oversees and acquires the projects and we shepherd it through until the manuscript is production ready, so until it goes ready for copy editing. So we coordinate with DeGroyer about peer review, but then we work with the authors about revising and that's with the help of series editors, acquisitions editors, and we make sure that, that manuscript is then publication ready. And then we also do what we call a gatekeeping process, and that's just to make sure that all manuscripts really do follow our style guide. Um, so it's surprising how many that come in that aren't quite ready. And we are just smoothing over and making sure that all permission issues are done, all images are ready to go, the style guide is followed, so when it gets to copy editing, it can be a really efficient process. And then when we hand over the manuscript to DeGroyter, it is truly production ready. Does this always quite work? No, but does it work on the whole? Yes. Um, the things that are still tripping us up a little bit is marketing text. So we try and prepare a lot of the initial marketing materials. We want to make sure that the cover blurb is ready to go. We know any updated author bios. And we know that later in the process when we're ready to, we know what conferences we'd like to promote things at, where we want to send review copies. We can send this all in a bundle then to DeGroyer. So then DeGroyer takes over the arranged copy editing, typesetting, cover design, printing, distribution. So later in the process, MIP does have a quality control checkpoint. So we overlook all the typeset proofs. We double check covers for accuracy. Of course, flips still happen, but we, the more eyes we can have on a project, the better it is. So we're, we're very much interacting, even though one part of the partnership might be in charge of a certain step, we're always communicating about it. So that's some of the, the challenges. It's, we have very different office sizes, whereas if a question comes up at the MIP office, we can very easily go next door and ask and just get something resolved very quickly. Degrader is obviously much bigger than we are. They're fairly siloed, so we have to depend on email and communication, and sometimes that's easier said than done. Because DeRuiter is large, they have siloed departments, so getting some details, our main contacts are in the editorial department, so getting marketing or sales information is sometimes a little bit challenging. Metadata, we love metadata, librarians love metadata, presses need metadata to help track projects, and it's frustrating because our two metadata systems simply cannot talk to each other. So when we have updates, we have to manually update and make sure that those updates are communicated on both sides. And sometimes that works beautifully and sometimes it doesn't. And things like a minor title change can become an issue because we need to make sure that it's communicated to all the correct people. Um, it is far easier for DeGrader to get access to our systems than for us to get access to theirs just through a quirk of limitations of usernames and VPNs and things like that. So it's, it, that, that can make things a little bit challenging. Um, marketing is both a, a benefit and a challenge because DeGrader has a far wider marketing reach, but we have more of a corner in the medieval market for where we're actively marketing our tech. So we know the U.S. conferences and the major medieval conferences that we want to hit, and we often send our acquisitions editors to attend there. 
social media, we're a little bit more active um, in getting posts out there, taking advantage of our audience on Facebook and Twitter and getting that done. Branding is a little interesting because authors sometimes are confused <laughs> because yes, we're a partner. So are the books MIP books? Are they degrader books? They're both. So it's how are things cited? How are we really branding this and getting the word out there? That, that can be interesting. There are many positives though. It's our production is efficient and we're getting books out there. And Degrader has actually had to hire people to keep up with our production. So they have new people in their production and editorial department solely focused on our books, which is wonderful. Work is done very efficiently because we have very similar production timelines and standards. So it's, it's really two equals talking about this. The strength of our projects is growing because we're able to lean on the benefits of, of each other. So we have the subject matter expertise, they have a little bit more of the publishing reach and scale and aspects so that we're able to lean on each other and make our projects even stronger. We're both growing and learning in ways that we couldn't have done before because of our partnerships at attending conferences or in the world that had physical conferences that we were all going to. And we have, I think, strengths in different part of the, the publishing program. And it's really useful to have that mutual sounding board and support system for the projects that, you know, are a little bit more challenging or experimental and we're getting into. We'll, we'll talk about some of the more digital aspects that these partnerships are able to get into. So that's been a, a, a great positive. So it's, it's, it's been a very good relationship and I'm curious to see, so we're two years down and I'm curious to see where, where we go. So that's the case study with MIP and Degrader. So I'll turn it back over to my colleagues. Great, thanks, Teresa. I'm, gonna, I'm going to pick up with the um, Clemson perspective on the Clemson-Liverpool partnership. Um, first, with a little bit of background about Clemson University Press. Um, we are one of the youngest university presses. Um, we were founded in 2000, so we're celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. Um, we we're founded actually as a pedagogical center. Um, so in other words, working primarily with students, engaging them in publishing activities. Um, in, it, in its early years, the press published three to five books a year under the, under the imprint Clemson Digital Press. Most of this was, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of central funding. Um, which meant that, you know, books were sometimes printed in very small print runs. Oftentimes it was a PDF online. Um, um, we rebranded as Clemson University Press in 2014 after entering into our strategic international partnership with Liverpool. Um, I've been at the press since 2015, first as a managing editor. Uh, I was appointed to direct the press um, when my predecessor retired in 2016 and have since worked to professionalize and grow the press in both output and reputation. We're slated to publish 28 books in 2020 plus seven journals. We currently publish 11 book series, predominantly in the areas of 19th and 20th century literature and the arts and books that serve the region um, and contribute to Clemson's land grant mission. And we became part of um, Clemson Libraries in July 2019 situating us within a broader team of um, information professionals. Um, we have benefited from that partnership, both in terms of visibility within the institution, the library is much more central than our previous position in an academic department. Um, and um, we also benefit from the expertise of information professionals around us, like for instance, metadata specialists. Um, we are um, currently compiling our supporting materials to apply for membership in the Association of University Presses, um, which is a development that just would not have been possible without the partnership with Liverpool. Um, so a little bit about our, um, how our partnership is structured and um, its mechanics. Um, the partnership with Liverpool funded a new position at Clemson, the managing editor position. Um, which serves, this person serves as the primary liaison with Liverpool colleagues and distribution and marketing, um, as well as the point person for all production for Clemson Liverpool books. Um, the expectation from the onset was that Clemson would publish 20 books with Liverpool per year, um, and Liverpool would contribute to the managing editor's salary and underwrite the cost of production for those books, including cover design, copy editing, typesetting. Um, they'd also print, distribute, and market the books using existing staff and vendors. And what I mean by that is they have a, a, an agreement with JSTOR 
they are distributed by Oxford University Press in North America. So these books would be available through those channels as well. Um, they'd also manage subrights, licensing, and royalty payments. So essentially, Clemson would operate as an editorial shop, handling acquisitions and liaising with authors during the manuscript to bound book process um, and preparing the manuscript for um, production, similarly to um, the situation that Teresa described. Um, in other words, we would be a small staff out producing for its size because the rest would take place in the UK. Um, publishing decisions are made by um, an editorial advisory board comprised of 13 Clemson faculty and three representatives from Liverpool, including Anthony Kant, um, who's uh, our co-panelist. Um, so we, we make decisions about what we publish together, together, um, and after peer review. Um, Clemson would, of course, you know, under the terms of the agreement, Liverpool publishes a robust list on its own, of course, um, and Clemson would continue to publish and does books and journals independently of Liverpool. Um, um, particularly, um, the books that we publish independently tend to be the kind of books that really are, uh, would stand to benefit less from the international aspect of our transatlantic partnership. If there's a, a a meager, modest, or non-existent transatlantic market, um, then it is. it just doesn't make sense to partner there. Um, in broad strokes, we still follow the original um, map of our working relationship, but I think we collaborate a bit more um, intensely than maybe was perhaps originally projected. I think this is a good thing. Um, so for instance, take marketing. We have a brilliant marketing executive at Liverpool who handles the marketing of our joint list. Um, review copies, conference exhibits, promotional materials for authors, ads. Um, we're in regular contact, we meet monthly, um, often on video. Um, so we also transitioned online pretty easily. Um, yet Clemson has its own social media accounts that need to be maintained in order to build our own brand. Um, we attend eight to 10 conferences or festivals each year in addition to those where Liverpool is sending our books or representing them. Um, we, we like to include Liverpool books in our conference exhibits. It, asks, it, it prompts um, scholars and communities we're trying to build, in which we're trying to build relationships. It prompts them to ask questions about our partnerships so I can explain. Um, but we also bring, um, you know, so we bring cards from editorial staff at Liverpool um, when there's a book that's being described to me at a conference that doesn't really fit within our list, but might fit with Liverpool's. I have a card to give them. Um, we also publish our own seasonal catalogs. So in other words, we're, we're doing some marketing too. They're doing some marketing. Um, the books get a full robust treatment um, and marketing as a result of the partnership. Um, there's no one size fits all partnership with any book. Right? Um, sometimes Clemson undertakes the production on a joint book, sometimes just typesetting. The vast majority of production happens in the UK. Um, on the occasional project, we partner with Liverpool on digital distribution. So in other words, we make the book available through JSTOR. Um, but we maintain independent print distribution. Um, some challenges. Um, the, I, I think it's important to say that a lot of the challenges and benefits that um, Teresa described about her, uh, about her international partnership also apply to ours. Um, I have just um, you know, tried to differ a little bit in order to broaden the conversation here. Um, so, um, you know, partnerships of this kind are vulnerable to shift in, shifts in geopolitics, the vigors of the exchange rate between currencies, um, brand building. Um, initially, we really traded on the brand of our larger partner to acquire books. Um, so establishing our own brand has been a little bit of a slower process. Um, so for instance, um, Teresa mentioned citations. Um, I love to see Clemson and Liverpool um, in citations, but a couple of times repeat authors it's always good when an author comes back to you with a, a second project, right? It indicates that you, um, you know, you've given them the kind of author experience that they expect and you've built a relationship. Um, but they often send a CV with their proposal um, and the CV, <laughs> CVs of a couple of these um, repeat authors whose work, you know, whose collaboration we really value has listed um, their first book with us as a Liverpool book. Um, so that's a sort of a consequence of pushing, pushing the partnership as a, a major acquisition strategy. Um, the, um, also in terms of brand building, um, the target of 20 books published a year has taken real time to reach. It's taken time to build the brand. Um, we nearly met the goal in 2019. We will meet it in 2020. Um, another challenge is staff size. We have a, a small yet dedicated staff. Um, 
uh, working at Clemson um, that prioritizes meeting our publishing targets with our international partners, um, which places some limits on the kinds of things that we can undertake independently. Um, I think that's just the natural order of things. Um, we also don't necessarily have the um, infrastructure, right? So for instance, royalty payments and things like that are something that, you know, if we take on a book um, independently, then that's something that we have to manage. Um, we can't rely on the infrastructure provided by Liverpool for that. Um, some benefits, there are many. I'm just gonna highlight a few. Um, global reach, our books are exhibited on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, we have, uh, we try to publish books that really do have a, a global market, um, at least a transatlantic market. Um, and it's so it is really, I think, increased um, Clemson's international footprint. Um, mostly we're known for football, but we're, we're, we want to be known for books too. Um, efficiencies. Um, Clemson is highly productive for our staff size without compromising on the author experience or quality of the scholarship. Um, we use the infrastructure provided by Liverpool. So we enter metadata directly into their system that they use. So we don't have to, you know, uh, try to articulate those two things. Um, we don't have to negotiate separate contracts with vendors for distribution, royalty management, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of brand building, the other side of that um, is that we, um, Clemson's reputation has grown steadily as a result of this partnership and the expansion of relationships within our publishing niche. Um, and now we're expanding into areas where Liverpool has a strong list in order to grow our output sustainably. So for instance, we re recently launched um, 18th Century Moments, a book series that complements Liverpool's 18th Century Worlds, as well as our partnership with the Voltaire Foundation. Um, these books, um, you know, the efficiency that's introduced here is that they'll be effectively marketed and we can expand our list without, um, you know, creating a whole new set of conferences we need to go to in order to effectively market the books. Um, and lastly, um, the, a, a primary benefit for me um, and for Clemson University Press in this partnership has been mentorship. Um, as a younger press, um, growing, we are able to draw and regularly do on the expertise of people who's, who've been in publishing for 120 years. Um, and so uh, one example of this is in the process of applying for membership to the Association of Uni University Presses, a big landmark in Clemson's, um, Clemson University Press's history. Um, I've been able to ask questions of Anthony, um, who has been very involved in the association. Um, and, you know, that, that also applies to just daily, daily questions, acquisitions, vendors, how things work. Um, if there's a, a question that I have about something that relates to our independent list, they're always happy to help, right? So we've benefited tremendously from that kind of mentorship. Um, and with that, I'll, I will pass it on to Anthony. Thank you, John. Um, so it falls to me, I think, to give the, the perspective from the larger partner. Um, bear with me on this. Unfortunately, I, it does require me giving you the potted history of LUP because I think to understand the present and future of our partnership, you really need to understand the, the, the way we arrived uh, into it. So Liverpool, as John alluded to, is an old press. It's the third oldest in the UK after Oxford and Cambridge. It's been around for more than 120 years. For much of its history, it's fair to say no one quite knew what to do with it. Uh, at various points, uh, it did wonderful things. At others, it, um, it was on the brink of closure. Most recently, in 2002, uh, there was a two-year moratorium and the press was put on hold while they reviewed the future of LUP. Should there be a press in Liverpool? If so, what would it look like? Should we close it? And in fact, it came very close to that. For reasons that would fill the rest of this call, um, a decision was made not to uh, not to close the press in Liverpool. And instead it was relaunched uh, at the end of 2004 um, in a slightly different structure with a degree of autonomy from the university, still owned by the university, um, still with university senior managers on the board of it, but, um, but uh, with a s more, more freedom than perhaps is common for uh, university presses. Uh, I joined in 2005 and at that point following the moratorium in which nothing could be published or progressed the book uh, there were seven books in the catalogue for that year uh, and the press published three journals uh, had around four staff um, it would have been at the very smallest end of um, the association of university presses uh, group one the smallest tier of presses which i think is where uh, a majority of uh, newer university presses now and um, library based some, some of the smaller library based presses are um, are, are likely to sit um, fast forward to this year, pre, 
pre-pandemic, um, we have a staff of 25. We published more than 150 books. We published 35 journals. And if, if our budget hadn't been wholly derailed, um, we'd have been um, hitting the point of joining the, the, the group three stage of of, uh, of university presses um, in the AU presses hierarchy. So uh, equivalent, um, it, it, it's a broad category, but one that includes uh, New York, Duke, Michigan and, and others. So we, we've, we've been through a, a process here, a, a really um, uh, interesting process. And um, uh, around 2008, when the, the big financial crisis hit globally, um, we, we weathered it really well. And we weathered it really well because we'd had our moment of crisis several years previously. Um, we had um, figured out our priorities. We'd refocused, we'd become more efficient. So we, 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 we moved from a, a press that covered the waterfront to one that had a, a small number of, of strong uh, editorial uh, uh, focuses. We had um, moved to embrace digital, we had uh, got rid of some stock, uh, and we had um, uh, an emphasis on, on uh, flexibility, agility, um, workflows that were scalable, we looked to recruit um, flexibly. So uh, we're all thinking now about working from home. Actually, we have, for instance, um, uh, a head of production who's been with LEP for 10 years, who is actually, uh, uh, yeah, we're, we're in the UK. He's an American living in Poland. Um, it, it, it works uh, really well for us. We, 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 we recruit talent and we retain it and uh, we're, we're, we're flexible around that. Um, so we, we've had our, our, our moment to think about how how the future will will evolve and we continue to do that that mentality has stayed with the press we we position ourselves as a as a 120 year old startup um uh, and we try to have the the best of both in in uh, in what we're doing um so having having come up with something that worked for us we then thought about how um how that could progress beyond LUP. it's um it's a, a clear fact that the future of publishing is both digital and international and I think we've all embraced digital in various ways. What does international mean? And international can mean simply selling your books in different markets and having a distribution and uh, authors from around the world and I think many presses are, are, are doing that. Um, but but, but what, what else could that mean? Um, and we started to think about about the models of partnership and John's already alluded to the fact that university presses thrive on partnership whether that's a partnership with a department on campus or a cultural institution um, or whether that's a partnership with an external um, and we work with a number of, of uh, imprints organizations um, and we began to think about other university presses and we began to think about North America which is of course the largest market for scholarly books um, so in, in thinking about that future, you know, how, how, how could we do more in the US and why should we do more in the US and how could we do that in a, in a sustainable way? Because let's be clear, no, nobody makes a fortune out of monographs. I mean, they are, um, university press publishing is not, is not a gold mine. Um, uh, so we, we began to think about this creatively and think, of, think about the, um, the partnership models. I actually read the book. There is a book on the Rochester Boydell and Brewer partnership um, and that provides some interesting pointers. Um, but um, we began to explore the idea of, well, um, what would it look like? And I, and, and I think, I think the, the Rochester model and the model that, that um, MIP and, and Clemson uh, have as well are, are, are very similar in that the editorial skill, the editorial expertise um, needs to reside with, with um, the the uh, smaller partner. Um, that's where that's where the partnership will thrive. That's where the value is to that institution in having the expertise that chimes with the institutional mission that can tap into institutional priorities, um, and that and that's essential. If you look at the Ithaca study, which is the best um, and most complete study on the cost of a monograph, you can see that the editorial function, um, uh, the commissioning, curation, peer review. Um, is is a big chunk of the cost of a monograph. It's expensive, it's um, complicated, um, it's the one area that's very difficult to um, introduce any kind of efficiency. We can talk to the to the end of the day about new wonderful platforms that will create efficiencies, but but the, there's a core human element to that which is very difficult to replicate. Um, and if if we can have a partnership where where that that expertise and and from a business point of view some of that cost sits with with one press and we can provide some of the other then we're sharing costs um, we're sharing costs which is making it more more sustainable um, but there's also a mission-based element to all this um, I heard the uh, the sonorous voice of Charles Watkinson a few weeks ago give a presentation <coughs> excuse me in which 
he referenced um, university presses as the, I, mean, I wrote this down because I thought it was so good, the inter-institutional infrastructure for the, the humanities and social sciences. I love that idea of, of, of university presses um, providing a framework in which, in which um, scholarship can thrive. Um, and we are a university press, we're a mission-based publisher, so in addition to any commercial value in this, actually helping to support and understand the international um, infrastructure for the humanities is really important and um, working with Clemson has been really valuable uh, to, to us um, in that. Uh, in, in finding our partner, and we were proactive in, in looking for a partner, we wanted a press that had potential. We thought we could bring um, amplification really. We, we, have, we have an infrastructure uh, that works, we have um, uh, skills, resources, experience that we could we could take something that had potential and, and grow it, and we saw with Clemson a press that had um, the makings of strength in that that particular time, and it has it has diversified slightly, but 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 um, particularly in modernism, um, and that that has grown significantly with uh, with John's addition to the team. I think the current team in Clemson is very strong. John and Alison. Um, John is, uh, as a modernist, he'll appreciate the illusion here. Um, uh, T.S. Eliot, uh, in, in his field as a practitioner, somebody immersed in the field, somebody who can bring real real value for, for scholarship um, uh, and from scholarship uh, in, the, in the publishing process. So it's, it's created a, a, a very strong, distinctive list that's, um, that's a real credit to Clemson. And we can, we can work with that. It's a list that sits alongside what we do um, there is now a little bit of overlap but for the most part this was th there was there was synergy without competition um, John's alluded to to another of the the benefits that um, that, that is is semi-financial and that, that is the, the the conference representation and the general presentation in North America it costs a lot of money uh, to to attend a US conference if you're a UK based publisher uh, John's if John attends uh, John and team attend eight conferences a year Eight, eight conferences plus transatlantic flights plus accommodation um, that, that's beyond the reach of, of even a medium-sized university press in the UK and I'm sure I'm sure coming in the other direction there are similar uh, similar constraints so we can share those sorts of costs as well if, if, if we're attending conferences in the UK and Europe um, we can have Clemson material there if John's attending uh, in the US we can have um, uh, LUP material there and I think that there are significant um, seemingly peripheral but actually very significant benefits to, to both parties in that in that kind of collaboration. Um, I think the, 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 the final point that I mentioned is that uh, the future now more than ever is is uncertain. Um, we have as a, as a press in Liverpool been a uh, we're, we are a monograph publisher, we are a journals publisher, we publish digital collections, we have a variety of models, we've embraced open access um, in a fairly pioneering way. Uh, in the UK for, for an HSS publisher. Um, uh, but those international partnerships also um, allow us to defray a little bit of risk. Um, different international contexts bring different policies, bring different um, trajectories. And um, I think John will now say a little bit more about open access where there's one particular um, point in which we might pick up. Um, thanks, Anthony. At, at this at this point in the um, in the presentation, each of us are going to briefly, ever so briefly, introduce um, uh, one way in which our our focus on internationalism and partnerships constellates outward to the broader um, scholarly communication, scholarly publishing ecosystem. Charles Watkinson, actually, in the presentation, you mentioned him. His sonorous voice, also, I, I hear him saying, "Stop using, stop focusing on scholarly communications as a phrase, and just say scholarly publishing." Um, and I, I, I take that and understand it. Um, I think even as libraries are moving toward a, um, you know, library publishing units, um, you know, they are actually publishers, right? And collaborating with university presses intensively, and sometimes they're part of the same organization. Um, so I'm, I'm introducing open access. So I got a, a wonderful segue there. Um, so our, our partnerships, I hope illustrate that publishing is international. Um, and scholarship is international too, um, as Anthony alluded to, and um, our, our authors are international, our readers are international. In 2020 alone, Clemson with Liverpool will publish books by scholars based in the US, UK, continental Europe, India, and Japan. Um, so our scholarship is international, our authors are international, publishing is international, yet open access policies and funding structures are rigidly local or national. Um, and this is one of those one of those ways in which policy has not really caught up to practice um, and funding structures in particular. So, for instance, 
um, Plan S, which is under the European Commission and the European Research Council um, from 2021. They um, have mandated all scholarly publications on the, that result from research funded by public or private grants provided by national, regional, and international research councils and funding bodies must be published in open access journals, on open access platforms, or made immediately available through open access repositories without embargo. Um, this um, predominantly is focused on science, um, science-based publications. Um, research England, um, the um, body that, um, for lack of um, finesse and phrasing, essentially um, provides benchmarking for UK institutions and allocates research funding accordingly, um, is mandating that they, they are ranking higher or weighting more heavily research that is open access. Um, and funding, but only within the UK to UK academics, um, which um, and UK publishers, which therefore you know incentivizes a, a sort of um, little England mentality. Um, in the United States, we have no, we we really have no national <laughs> sort of. We we are bifurcated. We are ad hoc. We are oftentimes at the institutional level. I know at Clemson we have a a very popular open access fund um, that is provided at the university level. Um, it is, it could in no way meet the demand um, for open access publishing. Um, and I think all of, I think I can probably speak for all of us and for the vast majority of university presses when I say that if um, that editorial upfront process, the, the, the professional editing, copy editing, typesetting, distribution, royalties, all of the kinds of things that go into publishing and making sure that publishing professionals are paid for that kind of author experience that authors come to expect, right? None of us are running a mill. We all engage pretty extensively with our authors. We add our ideas, we shape them. We have peer reviewers who contribute to the process. It's a long laborious process um, and exciting and um, generative. And, um, but we also have to pay people, you know, a living wage, right? Um, but if open access were, you know, if, if all of that were covered, I think we would all, we would, we would all have an inclination to be open. Um, it's just, it's not a financial, um, it's not feasibly financially. So essentially what I'm getting at here is that, and um, Teresa and Anthony are, are very welcome to add to it. Um, but essentially what I'm getting at is that the policy, which is rigidly local, um, is, does not reflect the international scope of publishing. Yeah, I would I would agree. I, it's we don't have as much to add with the OA part because it's it's something that has allowed our partnership with Dick Reuter is something that has been allowed allowing us to get more into the OA field. So their size, their scale, they they just purely have more experience. So that's something that we have gained in our partnership. So they have structures in place. If we want to have a book with one open access article, how do we do that? Or one open access essay? If we have a book that wants to go all OA or delayed. So it's our... MIP has absolutely benefited in the partnership with just the sheer per size difference and European, I think, more advanced expectations about having OA access. So that is something that we have absolutely benefited from. Anthony, I don't know if you have anything to add, but this might be a natural segue into the next topic. But. Yeah, I, mean, I, I will just, I will just add. I think, I think. Um... I mean, the open access point is, is is part of a wider one. That there's a there's a kind of an anthropological value in these partnerships, in that um, perhaps some of the uh, pressures and trajectories and movements in 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 one region um, will help better inform um, some of the situations uh, elsewhere. Uh, so so I think. Um, you benefit from the, the the European engagement with uh, open access um, actually going in the other direction. It's really interesting uh, for me to speak to John, uh, somebody who is um, uh, 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 a scholar in the US as well as a press director and also is, is part of a library team. 
um, and actually to get those sorts of insights. So I think I think I think there's a there's an ability to to to, to share and learn from um, each other in, in in all sorts of ways. And open access, of course, is a particularly lively topic of debate. No doubt for this audience as well. Um, it's a reality that that we. Um, we engage with and have done for um, you know, more than a decade on the book side of things and, and, and longer with journals. Um, so I think I think there's certainly opportunities for, for collaboration and learning, but, um, but open access is one of many areas in which to do that. Okay, the next topic is on to me and it kind of segues naturally into the digital aspect in scholarly publishing and I think when people mention digital, they automatically think ebooks, and that's not all that digital means in publishing anymore. So I think one of the biggest advancements in the past couple of years is is getting away from paper. And I think international partnerships even more benefit from digital everything, going to digital proofs, uh, digital printing rather than offset printing, and it helps us economize and efficient be just plain more efficient and get books that aren't atrociously expensive out to the public that we want them to get to. Um, but we do also naturally think about ebooks, and that's one thing that our partnership has allowed us to finally get to. So being a medieval press, some of our scholars aren't necessarily wedded to ebooks yet. They, they, I think there's always going to be a call for the physical books, but our partnership has allowed us to actually have a little bit of freedom now to finally digitize our backlist. And that's something that we are now able to get into a new market. So getting those ebooks out and that hits us also allows us to hit markets for our audience that we hadn't been able to. So people who can't afford shipping from the US or even from Germany can more easily get an ebook and have it the next day or instantaneously. So that is allowing us to reach an audience that we had no, you know, in, in, into before. So I think that's an, a wonderful benefit of these partnerships to have that idea of scale, the wider marketing reach, the wider interest group, and getting people to see titles that they never would have before. So, and then having different contacts with even, okay, who who is out there that can scan some of these books? Who do we send them to? And that has those contacts and the different library groups and getting thing to who has contacts with where JSTOR, Project News, and some of these other vendors. So that's where these partnerships also naturally lead to. So I don't know if John or Anthony, you guys have other things to about the, on the digital, non-OA digital side. I, I'd reinforce that point. I think that, that um, if we talked about the benefits for um, us as publishers, but what, what a great thing for an author to find that a book published some years ago that that may, may be out of print even, um, suddenly there's the resource there and the reach to digitize it to make it more widely available. Um, no uh, university presses, or certainly the, the small university presses and, and medium-sized university presses don't have the budgets to um, to, to, to um, systematically do this necessarily. Um, so to, to work with a larger partner to to, to really uh, maximise the audience, I think I think it's got to be great news for authors. It's got to be great news for readers. It's got to be a genuine service to scholarship. Um, so I think I think it's a it's a real benefit of the um, of the transatlantic partnership. I'll just add briefly that. Um, through the partnership with Liverpool, we I, I have we we've taken advantage of infrastructure that they have built and agreements that they have with JSTOR and other aggregators, University Scholarship Online, um, but also in this climate, we in our most recent um, you know batch of proposals to go to the board, there are there is at least one that makes the most sense to be a digital original book. Um, you know, with the possibility of print on demand as an option for a really dedicated, devoted scholar. This is particularly the case with research volumes that are big and heavy, um, where someone would actually benefit from control Fing their way <laughs> through, um, you know, to find, you know, to make scholarly connections. Um, so as a, as a, a scholarly resource, actually, it, it is conducive to an ebook format, which is something that Clemson wouldn't be able to, would would be able to do. I mean, we're born as a digital press, but um, essentially, what what we were lacking was the ability to connect that with an audience. Um, and through the international partnership, we're able to reach them. Great. So I think the the, the third talking point is perhaps a um, an amalgam or, or, or resonates with the the previous two. Um, 
uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, scale as a as a as a force in in um, publishing and in the in the scholarly ecosystem at the moment. So, um, and 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 I'll and I'll, I'll I'll give you examples of, of, of big and small. So, thinking about transformative agreements uh, to speak to open access for a moment. Transformative agreements come about for a variety of reasons. Uh, uh, one of those reasons is a is a general dissatisfaction with um, the the current state of affairs, the way that uh, the big deal and, and and other other elements of of, of big publishing have uh, have worked out for for the academy and for libraries. Um, of course, transformative agreements are effectively, for the most part, handcuffing libraries to the largest possible publishers, um, quite possibly uh, at the exclusion, uh, eventually, one way or another, of of uh, smaller publishers. Um, so scale, scale is becoming a, a, a big factor in in uh, in the publishing world. Um, we're seeing we're seeing um, bigger publishers. We're seeing mergers. We're seeing acquisitions. Um, that there's not much of a of a middle ground outside of university presses between the very large publishers and 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 small um, new university presses, scholar-led presses. Um, Micro presses. Uh, so, uh, on the on the one hand, um, open access actually is surprisingly f f forcing um, scale to be a, a significant driver. Um, on the other hand, so too is is digital. Um, if we think about uh, what librarians, readers, authors expect and think about, there tends to be a, a commonly uh, now expected or arrived at set of standards so scholarship is, is having to fit into a, a particular kind of box we talk all the time digital humanities scholars have talked about this for years about about how um, we should be doing more um, digitally and thinking about things differently but actually the for the most part there's an awful lot that's that's sitting inside a particular digital container and a particular digital container where that infrastructure is prohibitively expensive it's a, it's um it's hugely expensive for a press of our size, it's it's um, prohibitively expensive for much smaller presses. And yes, there are there are um, uh, free or, or, or open source um, software that can be used to to handle some of this coming out like OJS or whatever. Um, but um, but it, scale is is um, it's becoming quite stifling, I think. Um, so on the one hand, we've got we've got scale and and and, and a, a push that, that that suits big publishers. On the other hand, uh, as a response to that, we have new new scholar-led presses, smaller presses, presses where the uh, editorial impetus is absolutely tied into scholarship and practice. Um, and yeah, how how can how can those be reconciled? And actually, one way is again through through partnerships. So working with um, so a, a smaller scholar-led, um, absolutely embraced in scholarship, securing maximum value uh, for for the institution, working with a larger publisher, um, on the other hand, that has their infrastructure, will enable bibliodiversity in a way that that perhaps um, is otherwise quite challenging. Um, so I think I think this kind of partnership is is um, it, a great way actually of 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 maintaining bibliodiversity at a time when when forces of scale actually are are stifling it i don't know if anybody wants to add to that or is that a lovely concluding point i think that's a lovely concluding point <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Thank you very much to um, to Nasig and to Teresa and to Anthony um, and um, to Heidi um, for making this happen. And I, I really look forward to um, following up in the um, in, in the chat um, and responding and engaging with anyone who has taken the time to um, hear some of what we had to say about international partnerships. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much to uh, Teresa, John, and Anthony for their presentation today. And thank you to all of you for attending the session. Um, as John noted, <clears throat> they will be uh, monitoring the NASIG forum. So that's where you will be able to uh, join the conversation. The links to the forum, the schedule of presentations, and our code of conduct are below this video, as I noted before. And we ask that you, again, please tweet about this session using the hashtag NASIG2020. Thank you again. <laughs>